Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Minarsik again for our final session, our final chapter of Robbins, in, uh, which we'll be discussing the pathology of the eye. It's been a long haul. We spent 10 whole chapters uh, discussing general pathology, and this will be our 19th chapter of systemic pathology. I feel like we did a very, very good thing. And as a reward, I want to tell you that the uh, presenter of the first 28 chapters was John R. Minarsik, MD. And the presenter of the final 29th chapter will also be John R. Minarsik, MD. But this will be a little bit younger, junior John R. Minarsik, MD. I would like to introduce my son. He is a world-famous ophthalmologist. I hope he does not get a little bit embarrassed when I tell you that, but he is. And uh, in about three seconds, I'm going to have him just uh, go at you and tell you all of the pertinent things you need to know about pathology of the eye. Johnny, I'm going to shut up for the rest of the hour. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks. That's all true except for the uh, world-famous part. Um, but uh, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's an honor to contribute to your lecture series. Uh, I'll do my very best. I'm not a pathologist. I'm a, uh, a surgical ophthalmologist, and I specialize in uh, vitreal retinal surgery. So um, I feel somewhat qualified to present uh, pathology of the eye uh, in, in the clinical sense. I'll present clinical pathology and give you uh, histopathologic correlations um, as I think that they're relevant and um, what ophthalmologists deal with every day is looking at live tissues under microscopes so we see uh, histology in vivo and this is just a fresh look hopefully for uh, you guys but I'll go ahead and get started um, this lecture is going to cover you know the eight sections of the ophthalmic system, uh, which are the orbit, the uh, eyelid and adnexa, the conjunctiva, the cornea, the uvea, the lens, the retina, and the optic nerve. I'm going to give you guys um, just a basic uh, anatomic um, introduction to the eye, because I know that this anatomy is not stressed during uh, medical school. I received uh, practically no training in the eyes in medical school, and I think that's common uh, all around the world. So we'll just make sure we're talking about this, uh, talking in the same language here. So I'll start with the basic parts of the eyes. Um, I'd like to get a little feedback here. Is my pointer visible? Absolutely. Okay, good. So here we'll start um, kind of in the direction of the light. This uh, dome, which is in the, the front part of the eye, which serves as the window for the light, is the cornea. And the cornea is a, a transparent tissue. And the next step is the space in between the cornea and the iris, which is what we refer to as the anterior chamber. This is an important space uh, when we're looking for ocular inflammation. Uh, next we have the iris. The iris is the aperture, the uh, colored part of the eye, you know, the brown or the blue or the green eyes. The iris is part of the uvea, which is the pigmented layer of the eye, which uh, has three parts. The uvea has the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid, which is the pigmented layer underneath the retina all the way around the eye. So the iris is the uh, first part of the uvea, or the anterior uvea. Next we have the lens, the crystalline lens of the eye. We have uh, the pars plana and uh, the retina, the retinal vessels. Um, the retinal vessels are a separate circulation from the choroid. The choroid has its own vascular supply. And finally the optic nerve. Um, the optic nerve consists of the axons of all the ganglion cells in the retina as they tra transmit their information back to the brain. So think of the optic nerve as the exit point from all the retinal cells. Uh, the, the transit from all the ganglion cells back to the brain. 
the sclera is uh, the collag collagenous shell of the eye. And as far as the uh, outer covering of the eye goes, we have the conjunctiva, which is a very thin layer that is on top of the sclera. And it's uh, continuous with the corneal epithelium. So conjunctiva, conjunctiva is the skin of the eyeball. And uh, we'll move on. Uh, first we'll uh, talk a little bit about the orbit. The orbit is the bony shell uh, which contains the eye and as well as the soft tissues which surround the eye. We'll get familiar with the anatomy and some uh, common pathologic conditions that uh, are uh, characteristic uh, for the orbit. The orbital anatomy uh, in terms of the bones is complex. There's seven uh, heavily involved bones in, in the orbital anatomy and I won't get into the details uh, except that it's a very interesting and busy uh, area of the skull. When we look at these two slices of the orbit, we uh, here's a parasagittal view um, showing, uh, just to get oriented, here's the bridge of the nose and the forehead and we're looking into the eye socket towards the nose. This is the medial wall of the orbit, um, comp comprised largely of the ethmoid bone. And then below it is the uh, maxillary sinus. And the, uh, the floor, we're getting a sense of the floor of the orbit. So the medial wall of the orbit is called the lamina propriciae because it's the, the, some of the thinnest bone in the body. Um, lamina parisha means the, the layer that's like paper. So that's about how thick the bone is. And as we look at the uh, transverse view, you can see the lamina papricia, the orbital uh, medial wall. The ethmoid is extremely thin and um, very similar to the uh, orbital floor, which is the maxillary bone on top of the maxillary sinus. We'll touch on these a bit in a moment. Looking deep into the orbit, we find the origin of all the eye muscles, which is the annulus of Zinn. The annulus of Zinn um, is a tendinous ring that encircles um, around the orbital, uh, excuse me, the optic nerve and many of the cranial nerves, which enter the, the uh, orbit through the superior ophthalmic, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the greater. Uh, uh, fissure here, the orbital fissure. The um, soft tissue uh, boundaries of the eye are important here. As we look at um, another um, parasagittal view here, this is the frontal bone um, in the forehead the uh, eyebrow, the uh, eyelid, and the eye. The anterior boundary of the orbit is the orbital septum. Clinically, this is a very important structure. It uh, is comprised of the periosteum of the uh, orbital bone here, which uh, bridges across all the way to the tendinous um, uh, structure on the levator muscle. Now the levator muscle is what raises and lowers the eyelid. So this um, periosteal uh, bridge is what makes the, the definitive layer which separates the outside from the inside of the orbit. One of the stereotypical pathologic processes of the orbit is the thyroid-related orbitopathy, or Graves' disease. Now, this is an autoimmune condition which is um, triggered by antibodies that attack inappropriately the thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor. Uh, and what this causes histologically is lymphocytic infiltration into the uh, extraocular muscles and orbital fat which causes fibrosis and enlargement of the extraocular muscles. These are the medial, the, the, the recti muscles, the inferior rectus, the medial rectus. They get very big 
and um, they cause a lot of crowding in that uh, orbital uh, bony cave. What you get is proptosis, where the eye is pushed forward. The muscles um, have a loss of function where there is restriction of movement and strabismus or um, ocular misalignment of the eyes. Exposure problems because the eye is being pushed out, it gets dry, and then occasionally it gets crowded enough to actually compress the optic nerve and cause an optic neuropathy, uh, which causes vision loss. Um, there's multiple uh, treatments for this condition, um, but uh, it's a little bit beyond the, uh, the scope of this lecture. Here's an example of the thyroid-related orbitopathy. We can see some, some really big uh, medial rectus muscles here on this transverse uh, CAT scan view. These are, much, these are about five times the size as you expect to see them. They should be very thin little belts you can see that they're even pressing on the optic nerve here, especially down in the apex of the orbit. Uh, histologic s section of those muscles would show this massive infiltration of these um, lymphocytes into the muscle tissue and then fibrotic changes of the muscle. Uh, here's a coronal section showing these muscles that are just way too big. Yeah. There's a lot of tumors that can uh, occupy the orbit as well. I think the ones worth knowing about, ones that often show up on board exams, are the ones that affect the pediatric population. Um, classic examples are rhabdomyosarcoma. is a, a sarcoma that affects the face and often shows up in the orbit. It's the, the most common primary malignancy of the orbit in children. And uh, neuroblastoma is another one that uh, will often show up on testing. It gives a, sort of a echimotic raccoon eyes uh, appearance in kids. Uh, inflammation. We talked about the orbital septum. Um, orbital cellulitis is when an infection extends beyond the orbital septum through that periosteal layer and invades the orbit here. Uh, this is a, a common Thing that um, is, is treated in emergency rooms. Um, you know, facial infections that start getting into this area are extremely dangerous, life-threatening, and uh, you can see how this uh, massive um, inflammatory, ill-defined inflammation is, is pushing the eye out of the orbit and uh, extending very close to the uh, central nervous system. Here's um, a mild and a uh, terribly severe uh, example of orbital cellulitis in a uh, child and a uh, uh, another one to the to the right here, which is much more advanced. We talked a little bit about the bones of the orbit. The clinical pathology of the bones of the orbit is trauma. These bones are commonly broken if um, someone is hit in the eye with with a fist or a ball. As you can see. Um, from this uh, schematic here, as the eye is pushed into the orbit, the orbit cannot expand, so it usually fractures in an outward pattern. That's a blowout fracture. You can see that the little thin layer of bone, which should uh, come across here, is being uh, pushed downward into the maxillary sinus, and the soft tissues like the muscle and the orbital fat can get trapped in this fracture. When this happens, the eye um, mechanically cannot rotate upward, and you get a scenario like this. A person like this could have double vision all the time and the inability to elevate the eye. Um, surgical repair consists of putting a plate uh, underneath that layer to uh, get all the soft tissues in the correct orientation. Um, okay, we're moving on to the eyelids. We have a uh, simplified schematic of a complicated piece of skin here. Um, the orbicularis oculi is, is the, the voluntary muscle you use to blink. And this is right under the uh, skin of the eyelid. Um, the tarsal plate is just a uh, collagenous condensation. It's not true cartilage like many people say, but it's a uh, collagenous condensation where there's a lot of meibomian glands which secrete the waxy portion of uh, the tear film through the meibomian gland orifices. 
and the conjunctiva is an extension of the skin as it moves back adjacent to the eye. The difference between conjunctiva and normal skin is that it's not keratinized. It's stratified squamous epithelium that's not keratinized, so it's smooth. It doesn't rub the eye, causing friction. This, by the way, is the palpebral conjunctiva because it's on the eyelid. Uh, here's a histologic uh, section of the eyelid, and something interesting, you can see the, the levator muscle aponeurosis, the tendon, as it comes down here, reaches all the way down, and you can see extensions of the levator aponeurosis going into the skin on the front side of the eyelid. Uh, this is what determines the um, the Western versus the Asian uh, eyelid appearance. Um, you know, the worldwide variance of how people's eyes look is determined by these um, wisps of uh, connections between the, the, the tendon and the outer skin. Here we have a look at some of the holocrine glands of the meibomian glands as they collect in these large linear uh, glands within the tarsal plate and eventually exit right about here. And of course the striated orbicularis skeletal muscle. Um, there are many tumors that can be found on the eyelids, but the most common one is the basal cell carcinoma. This is the most common malignant tumor. Uh, the most common benign tumor is the chalazion, which is uh, basically a foreign body reaction. We can get another look here at the meibomian gland orifices and, and their waxy secretions. Of course, these glands go deep into the eyelid, and when one of them becomes plugged up, the waxy holocrine secretions uh, sort of rupture from uh, beyond their usual boundaries and cause a foreign body reaction uh, where you can see you know, giant cells and, and uh, histiocytes which uh, um, you know, the typical um, granulomatous inflammation. The conjunctiva is the skin of the eye. It's non-keratinized. The portion that is on the eyeball itself is called the bulbar conjunctiva, and the part that's on the back of the eyelid is called palpebral, and they're connected way in the corner. So you can't lose anything behind your, it's impossible to have the contact lens rotate behind the eye, as a lot of my patients will ask me. Uh, this skin is rich in goblet cells, which uh, secrete mucin. Here's an example of the conjunctiva. This part is the palpebral part and the part on the white part of the eye is the bulbar part. And I put this picture in because uh, this person has a surgical implant made out of platinum, which is placed directly beneath the bulbar conjunctiva. And uh, with this reference here, you can see how thin it is. It's translucent, um, actually. Um, the white part that you see is the sclera underneath it, but um, you can see some very uh, wispy blood vessels in it as well. Pink eye is when you get a virus infection of the conjunctiva. The usual cause is adenovirus, but there's other causes as well. I bring this up to correlate to your um, uh, gastroenterology um, histology knowledge base. When you studied the, the gut, you learned about Peyer's patches, which were germinal centers um, for uh, lymphocytes. The same is true in the eye. There are germinal centers, like Peyer's patches, directly beneath the conjunctiva, and you get a, a look at them here. When someone gets a viral infection, these germinal centers get big. Ophthalmologists call them follicles, but you know them as... Uh, higher patches, and what they are is their malt, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. Um, here's another version of conjunctivitis. It's a rare one. This is another patient of mine that has a cat, and a new kitty uh, was 
been scratching her a lot, and she developed a granulomatous conjunctiva. Um, and we um, did a tissue biopsy, and we found that there was Bartonella hensley, which is cat scratch fever. There's a lot of common degenerative conditions of the conjunctiva, which uh, feature telestatic degeneration. People see these all the time in the mirror and they get very concerned about them and that's why I'd like to show you so you can say, ah, I know what that is. If it's a small yellow spot, it's just a little bit of sun damage on the conjunctiva. Um, we call this a pinguicula. It's elastotic degeneration from UV exposure. If it looks like the shape of a wing from Latin, we call it a pterygium. If it moves onto the cornea, in this triangular shape with stretched out blood vessels, that's called a pterygium. It's wing shaped, that's the root of the word. Uh, we talked about the malt, the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Um, there's also, um, you know, some lacrimal glands as well that have a lot of lymphoid uh, activity. Uh, this is a lymphoma uh, in the conjunctiva. And it is possible to uh, have these uh, tumors in the orbit. This is something that looks like a trigium, but it's actually bad. This is a gentleman who is a arc welder, um, an intense UV exposure, and a pipe smoker with lots of carcinogens. And he worked in a chemical factory, and he developed squamous cell conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. So this is, uh, you know skin cancer of the conjunctiva. This was excised and he's doing well. This is thought to actually arise from the human papillomavirus uh, types 16 and 18, which is implicated in all sorts of cancers, uh, such as uh, cervical, uh, if I remember correctly. The cornea is something that people ask me a lot, especially as it relates to LASIK surgery. Um, the cornea is really special tissue. It's, it's totally unique. There's nothing like it in the body um, because it's transparent, and it's transparent by design. It also is avascular and has a very precise organization. There's five layers. There's the epithelium, which is just uh, like the conjunctiva, and it's richly innervated by cranial nerve 5. There's um, Bowman's membrane, which is uh, just a thickened portion underneath the epithelium. Uh, the bulk of the cornea is the stroma. This is the tissue that's ablated in LASIK surgery or PRK surgery um, in order to correct your uh, refractive error. On the very inside of the, 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 the cornea is the epithelium, excuse me, the endothelium, which pumps the water out of the cornea and dehydrates dehydrates it and keeps it very clear. So here we have the stroma, the large central portion, and here we have the anterior chamber filled with fluid. Here we have these endothelial cells which dehydrate the stroma and keep the collagen fibrils, uh, type 1 collagen fibrils, at a very precise dis uh, distance, about you know a quarter of a wavelength of visible light spacing which uh, allows transparency to the tissue. Here's a couple slides showing some uh, sort of outdated uh, LASIK technology, but basically the epithelium is cut and a flap is uh, lifted off the surface of the eye. Laser is applied to the stroma to uh, 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 basically take some of the steepness out of the cornea usually for people who are nearsightedness and then the flap is put down back into place as I told you before the the uh, cornea doesn't heal the same as the rest of the tissues of the eye because it doesn't have any blood vessels and it has a much more um, uh, less rigorous uh, healing response so if you get LASIK surgery you have to worry about that flap becoming dislodged if you get hit in the eye. Uh, this is a gentleman who jammed a clipboard onto his cornea and smushed it up like an accordion. You can see the red reflex. This is the red eye view uh, where the, um, the anterior part of the cornea is all folded up like an accordion because the flap didn't stay put.
<coughs> Keratitis is uh, inflammation of the cornea, and there's lots of reasons for it. The classic board exam picture that I think has been on every single USMLE uh, known to man is this uh, herpes um, dendritic keratitis, where you see these little asterisk shaped uh, lesions in the cornea that glow when you put fluorescein dye in a black light on them. This is the classic um, viral infection of the corneal epithelium. Now, if you get inflammation within the stroma of the cornea, you get this um, loss of clarity. You get uh, stromal keratitis. Herpes viruses is the primary cause of this as well, but there's other things too, um, like trauma or a variety of other infections. Um, when blood vessels grow into the cornea, you know something's wrong. Uh, and you will lose transparency. So, epithelial and stromal keratitis in this uh, picture here, side by side. Here's your contact lens ulcer. When um, the cornea is uh, infected, you get an infiltrate. An infiltrate means a white spot. This is the same sort of infiltrate you might see on a chest x-ray. You see a white spot in tissue that's supposed to be clear. And you can also see some of the layering within the, the anterior chamber. This is called a hypopion. This is a bunch of white cells or neutrophils or uh, debris which are uh, collecting by gravity in the uh, bottom of the anterior chamber. This is an important thing to notice because a hypopion usually signals endophthalmitis, which is vision threatening. Corneal dystrophies are uh, structural deformations, or excuse me, um, dystrophies are, uh, I misspoke, uh, abnormal collections of material uh, within the cornea. There are many types and they make very pretty pictures, so I, I threw them in here. Here's a, a stromal dystrophy with um, hyaline material deposited in the stroma of the cornea. You know, this is your, your, your beautiful tissue staining, the muscles, uh, trichrome stain, the red, white, and blue, uh, where the hyaline stains bright red and um, basement membrane and, and the uh, decimase stains blue and the uh, epithelium is red, but this is the stroma and this is the abnormal hyaline within the cornea which looks like breadcrumbs when you see it on a microscope. Here's the same sort of thing, except this is amyloid. I just throw this in there because I know that you need to know what amyloid looks like. Uh, in lattice dystrophy, we get amyloid in the cornea, and it shows birefringence and uh, stains with Congo red. Here's a cornea ectasia. This is when the cornea becomes structurally weak and bends um, in uh, abnormal um, uh, shapes. There's a common heritable condition called keratoconus. This is the most common reason why a person can't get LASIK surgery because their cornea is already weak and it's at risk of uh, having structural changes like this in keratoconus. Um, these ectasias can also be caused by refractive surgery if the cornea is uh, uh, too weak. If too much of the stroma is removed, um, the structural integrity can be affected. This is a slit lamp view showing the layers of the cornea which are basically normal up here but um, deeper in you can see a break within decimase membrane. This is the anterior chamber. This is the iris. So all the white beam here is showing the layers of the cornea and how the, the the cornea ruptured on the back side of it and let the fluid inside here and it's become remarkably thickened and bent. Here's a cornea transplant. It's a pretty picture. Uh, the uvea I think is Latin for grapes and the reason why is because the, you know, the Pigmented tissues of the eye look purple and round. Um, they, they look like a grape surgically sometimes. 
But the uvea is, as I mentioned before, three structures, the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. And we talked about um, how they're all continuous and in different parts of the eyes. The iris is a diaphragm for light. The ciliary body is a muscular uh, portion. Uh, it's, a, it's a ring which can flex the lens via the uh, zonular fibers. And it also produces some of the aqueous humor. And the uh, choroid is a very vascular um, tissue which supplies the outer retina with oxygen. Here's the angle where we see um, the iris, the lens, the ciliary body, and um, a lot of uh, uh, pigmentation. The drainage, of, well, first of all, the, the, the aqueous humor is produced by this structure, the epithelium, and it goes into the anterior chamber here and eventually flows back out through the canal of Schlem and determines the pressure within your eye. This is important in uh, glaucoma because glaucoma is um, related to pressure problems uh, within the eye. I think um, the most important part of the uh, uvea clinically is, is the inflammatory diseases, um, especially for doctors other than ophthalmologists. When doctors can recognize inflammation in the eye, uh, such as uveitis, iritis is another uh, synonym for uveitis when we're talking about inflammation in the front of the eye. Um, this is often a, um, a physical exam clue to uh, serious systemic inflammatory diseases. Diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis and vasculitis like lupus and um, um, HLA B27 diseases, uh, even infectious diseases, often manifest with inflammation in the eye. We can see the, um, the cells within the anterior chamber on a slit lamp microscope. Uh, if you get the chance to master this exam, it's fairly easy, and um, you can actually see uh, aggregations of leukocytes floating around in the in the aqueous in the anterior chamber, and I think it's analogous to the little white specks which float around in uh, the snow globes. That's what it looks like um, under the microscope. <coughs> As I mentioned before, we were talking about histology in vivo. Uh, when I look at the eye and I look at the blood vessels, I can see the histologic process on live tissue. This is an example of a vasculitis. We can see arteries and veins within the retina here, and we can see the uh, leukocytes infiltrating the walls and the tissues surrounding the blood vessels. Um, if you looked at a cross section of this vessel you, you would see the, the, um, the white cells uh, infiltrating the spaces and causing uh, vascular occlusion, uh, narrowing the lumen sometimes. Um, this is what we call vascular sheathing, like there's a sheath of white stuff around the blood vessels, and here's a, a very severely involved one, and here's a lesser involved one. But uh, if you ever see something like this, you might be inclined to work up a patient for vascular diseases like lupus or uh, Wegner's uh, um, polyarteritis nodosum, the, the sarcoid. There's, there's a host of things. If you ever see vasculitis and you diagnose it, then you can uh, make the big save before um, end organs are involved. This particular case was a viral retinitis causing vasculitis. This is CMV retinitis and a panoramic view of most of the retina. The optic nerve, the macula, the uh, vascular arcades, and um, <clears throat> arteries and veins which are uh, sheathed in uh, uh, leukocytic infiltration here. 
Here's a common infectious process involving the choroid, a posterior uveitis. Inflammation involving the choroid. Um, this is toxoplasmosis. It's very common, um, especially in the you know, United States, Latin America. Um, we used to think that it's congenital, but more recently we think that probably more than 50% of the cases come from um, undercooked meat. The choroid's also important that, you know, ounce for ounce, it's the most highly perfused organ in the body, um, even more so than the kidney. And because of the, the rich network of blood vessels, it's a potential target for uh, metastasis, such as uh, you know, breast, lung, uh, prostate uh, tumors, uh, occasionally we'll see <coughs> in the choroid. And because it's so pigmented, it has um, just a very high level of um, melanocytic cells. Uh, melanomas are also common. Um, the problem with melanomas in the eye is that we can't tell when they're benign nevi or malignant melanomas in the same way that a dermatologist can by, by cutting the tumor out and um, uh, looking at it um, histologically. Um, of course, you know, if, if we took out a benign nevus of the eye, it would blind the eye. So what we use is ultrasound to measure the thickness of the tumor. A lot of studies have shown that the thickness, uh, along with several other features of the, of the nevus, is um, directly correlated to its, its chance of being malignant. So things that are greater than three millimeters are uh, almost certainly um, malignant and deserve very close observation, if not treatment. <coughs> Onto the lens. The lens is a very interesting uh, structure. Uh, again, very unique tissue in the body. Um, embryologically, it's derived um, from invagination of the surface ectoderm. It actually pinches off an inside out cyst of epithelial cells. And those cells stay confined within their basement membrane their entire life. Um, this is what gives rise to its very um, unique uh, structure. It's got the highest protein content of the body. These are the crystalline proteins, and they account for a very high refractive index. Uh, if you remember from physics, the N, uh, the ability to uh, refract light, to bend light. The um, ciliary body muscle is what actually flexes the lens and allows it to fine-tune the focus and uh, cause you know, shape changes within the lens. And in concert with the cornea, this, this is what helps us uh, see clearly when we accommodate or try to change our focus from far to near. Here's a look at that unusual uh, structure. It's a, a lamellar arrangement of epithelial cells that are trapped in a cyst. This is a um, type 4 collagen basement membrane with epithelial cells on the surface. The cells migrate and elongate and become layers all the way to the central core of the lens. Very reminiscent of the rings of a tree. The earliest layers are in the middle and the newest layers are on the surface. <coughs> This small structure makes up uh, most of our business. Cataract is, I think, still the most commonly performed eye operation. When those lens fibers become too sclerotic and light doesn't pass well through them for a variety of reasons, we remove the lens and um, put in a new one, an artificial clear one. Ultraviolet light and steroids and inflammation are all uh, implicated in cataract formation, but the most common cause is simply age. Everybody develops a cataract uh, eventually. All you have to do is live long enough. So here's our surgery. We come in through the clear cornea and we tear a small circle in that 
type 4 collagen basement membrane, which allows us access to those elongated uh, epithelial cells. We use an ultrasound wand to emulsify them and suck them back out. So the, the entire lens is removed in this manner, leaving behind this little capsular bag. Once the lens is removed, we inject a folded up, usually acrylic lens, and put it in that capsular bag, and the lens is calculated to match the person's length of the eye so the focus is just right. Onto the retina. This is uh, my area of interest. The retina's got, you know, a very complex uh, anatomical arrangement also. Um, multiple layers. We'll go over those briefly. Um, the retinal detachment is a common pathologic process that we'll talk about uh, involving the interaction between the vitreous gel and the, uh, the retina. Um, and we'll also talk about some vascular conditions, uh, macular degeneration and tumors. <coughs> Regarding the anatomy of the retina, uh, it's kind of a cascade of uh, transmission between several layers of neurons. So let's start with this top layer here and, and say that this is the inside of the eye. The light comes in and travels all the way through and hits the photoreceptors. These are the rods and the cones. And the um, outer segments are these uh, 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 stacks of pigments that can detect light and transduce a signal. The rods and cones are nourished by this retinal pigment retinal pigment epithelium down here and, and very highly metabolic area where um, a lot of uh, um, pigment is, is recycled into lipofusion. The signal is transmitted via the bipolar cells and all the way to the gang ganglion cells which arranges this information from the light, sends it through these axons which is called the nerve fiber layer, all the way back to the optic nerve and into the brain. I'm not going to belabor this uh, busy slide, but um, uh, suffice it to say that this is a very um, classic picture of the retina, showing the ganglion cells the inner nuclear layer or the, the nuclei of the bipolar cells and then the outer nuclear layer which is the nuclei of the photoreceptor cells, the actual photoreceptor uh, pigment cell, uh, layers, the retinal pigment epithelium and then the very pigmented and vascular choroid. We'll talk first about retinal detachment. This is a mechanical problem clinical pathology, a mechanical problem that we can fix. There's a lot of uh, vitreous gel in the back of the eye which has traction on the retina. Sometimes that vitreous gel can pull tears in the retina and it allows fluid to get behind the retina and actually detach it. When the retina is detached away from its retinal pigment epithelium, the photoreceptors are dysfunctional. They can't transmit light because they don't have the metabolic support. When we see a retinal tear, if we catch it before there's a detachment, and here's a, a clinical view through a, a 20 diopter lens, we can encircle it with laser spots. And um, this kind of acts like a spot welding procedure that does not allow any fluid to get underneath the retinal break. Uh, this is. Uh, one type of treatment we enjoy because it's very satisfying to uh, fix the retina in this manner and prevent big problems with a, a relatively simple fix that can be done in, the, uh, in an office chair. When the uh, tears are large, they tend to let fluid in and um, the retina becomes detached from the eye wall. The forces that normally hold the retina to the back of the eye are the, um, the 
the, the pump within the retinal pigment epithelial cells. They pump water actively out of the uh, space in between the rods and cones and the uh, RPD. This active transport of water is what creates a vacuum seal and normally keeps the retina attached. When that vacuum seal active transport process is overwhelmed by mechanical traction and fluid uh, ingressing into the, the subretinal space, then you get a retinal detachment. And then macular degeneration is a very common uh, process um, that we see in the elderly. This is a dysfunction of the RPE cells where they cannot keep up with the metabolic demands of the photoreceptor cells and um, there's an accumulation of uh, lipofusion pigment clumps and we get these characteristic little yellow spots in the central retina which we call drusen. Vascular conditions we will uh, talk about as well. The classic microvascular small vessel disease is diabetes mellitus. Um, the macula, ma excuse me, macrovascular conditions of the eye are uh, things involving the central retinal vein and central retinal arteries as well as the branches and we'll talk a little bit about those too. But first, um, the classic stages of diabetic retinopathy are the same as the classic stages of diabetic um, vasculopathy, which is, you know, first a thickened basement membrane, the loss of the supporting pericytes, microaneurysms, and eventually non-perfusion. Here we have a trypsin digest, you know, on a, on, on a glass slide where we can see this. Um, Ischemic tissue um, produces vascular endothelial growth factor. This is a very important point in modern medicine. This vascular endothelial growth factor is being implicated as uh, the cause of a lot of um, uh, disease conditions, especially in the eye, but uh, elsewhere also. Um, the inappropriate response to ischemia to grow um, uh, blood vessels is um, what causes a lot of proliferative diabetic disease. And I'll show you pictures of what happens when abnormal blood vessels are growing in the retina inappropriately as a response to the ischemia. Um, VEGF is also implicated in uh, other eye diseases like retinopathy of prematurity and um, um, other uh, uh, types of glaucoma as well. Excuse me. So we talked about the the trypsin digest. Here is uh, again our our in vivo histologic examination. This special photograph is called a fluorescein angiogram and we inject a fluorescent fluorescein dye into a person's vein beyond their arm. We let it circulate through their body and then we can photograph with black light the, uh, the details of the retinal vasculature. And here we have diabetes in action. You see all the stages. Um, well, I can't see the thick and basement membrane, I'll admit, but we can see the uh, microaneurysm formation and the uh, capillary non-perfusion and eventually the, the growth of abnormal new blood vessels, neovascularization. So this is a, a very advanced slide of uh, ischemic diabetic retinopathy. Very similar to the trypsin digest. And here is some severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You see the normal vessel pattern of the retinal veins and artery on the retina and then you see this very abnormal stalk that looks something like a palm tree coming up at us into the vitreous gel and um, growing wildly and exerting a lot of traction on the retina. This is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It's an abnormal response to the VEGF production 
because of the ischemia induced from diabetes. And um, this is a cause of tractional retinal detachments as well. This can pull the retina and, ca and cause uh, uh, retinal detachments. All these diseases involving VEGF are, are thought to be treatable by injection of anti-VEGF medicines, um, which are usually uh, fab fragments of antibodies that um, bind to the uh, VEGF molecule. It's, it's a new frontier in uh, many branches of medicine now. The, uh, the treatment with immunological medicines. We inject these medicines into the eye to treat some of this uh, depending on the circumstance. So regarding the, um, the large vessels of the eyes, I'll show you a few interesting pictures. This is a branch retinal artery occlusion. Looking at this picture right here, showing the optic nerve, you might see a suspicious yellow nodule which is trapped within the artery. This little nodule is called a Hollenhorst plaque, and it's basically a fragment of uh, calcium and platelets. This probably um, uh, came off of a calcific carotid artery, um, an atherosclerotic vessel which a small fragment broke free and traveled to the eye and occluded an artery. And you can see the, the area of paleness where the, the retina was obliterated when it lost its blood supply. You see on the fluorescein angiogram that the arteries and veins are flowing rather normally up on the top half, but where the Holland horse plaque was lodged, we have non-perfusion. Sometimes we see these further out in the vessels and you know patients are unaware of them and we're able to detect um, carotid artery disease or heart valve disease uh, and when we in, in institute the, the proper workups we can uh, uh, save the people you know uh, from having a stroke. Here's the opposite problem. A, uh, central retinal vein occlusion. This is when the backflow becomes disrupted, and they call this like a pizza pie fundus, or uh, blood and thunder is a description that's often used. The central retinal vein occlusion is often um, thought to um, occur from hypercoagulable or prothrombotic conditions occasionally. So. We uh, do work up for uh, blood disorders when we see this, if the uh, situation is suspicious. Here we have neovascularization also. This is neovascular glaucoma um, in a patient that had a central retinal vein occlusion. And now you can see that there's abnormal vessels growing into the iris. These red vessels are definitely not supposed to be there, and they will eventually cause fibrosis and closure of Schlem's canal and a very high eye pressure that will ultimately damage the optic nerve. This is again treatable um, perhaps with anti-VEGF antibody injections. Some of the brand names you may have heard about are Avastin and Lucentis. Retinal tumors are very uncommon but they're uh, classic, especially retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is special historic significance because it taught us about the, the gene control of tumors. Um, in particular, I, I think you should know about Knudsen's two-hit hypothesis uh, in its relationship to retinoblastoma. In this particular case, there are two copies of a tumor suppressor gene. Um, which basically um, prevent the formation of retinoblastoma. Uh, Nudsen discovered that if you even have one of these genes, um, it will be sufficient to suppress the tumors. However, if a person has a recessive condition where they only have one viable copy of the gene which produces the tumor suppressor, 
then if any one of those cells has a mutation that affects that last remaining tumor suppressor gene, they develop retinoblastoma. In addition to this um, uh, uh, historical um, item of interest, there's a, a classic histologic pattern with retinoblastoma that's interesting, and it's called Flexner Wintersteiner rosettes. It's this neat little red, white, and blue circle pattern. This this organization that is uh, sometimes seen on boards. Retinoblastoma is, is a really terrible tumor that is extremely rapid, uh, rapidly progressive in, in people that have delayed access to medical care. Um, we see these really horrendous pictures of, of children. Um, who are in un underserved areas uh, where the, the tumor can become very large and destructive. Okay, and on to our last segment, the optic nerve. I'm going to go through this rather quickly, but um, one thing that all doctors are, are asked to look for is um, optic nerve swelling, that is papilledema. So papilledema is almost synonymous with optic nerve swelling. There's a lot of reasons why you're optic nerve can be swollen, but we call it papilledema when the swelling is due to in increased intracranial pressure. So if a brain tumor is causing high CNS pressure, it's transmitted through to the optic nerve and causes swelling. So instead of seeing the nice round, distinct margin of the optic nerve, we see a blurry, uh, deformed image. Now, glaucoma is the other pathologic um, condition involving the optic nerve. This is a, um, a gradual loss of axons in the optic nerve, and we think the main risk factor for this is eye pressure, although there are probably other factors involved. When we lose the axons, we get peripheral visual field loss. So here's a chronology. This is a normal nerve with a very small cup. You see nice healthy pink tissue throughout. But it's hard to see any um, empty space within the nerve. Now here's a moderately cupped nerve where we see that really only about 80% uh, of the nerve, uh, well, excuse me, about 80% of the nerve is empty space. So this is moderate uh, cupping of the optic nerve. And it would become severely thin where it's almost all gone. The notches extend all the way to the margin of the nerve. Um, we know that the axons are absent here and uh, people lose their peripheral vision, which um, uh, coincides with the arc that the axons travel. This is a, a retrograde degeneration from the axons all the way back to the ganglion cells where they originated. So that is basically the end of the lecture. Um, the key topics um, we've uh, discussed, and um, you know, I, I, I appreciate very much the chance to lecture to y'all, and um, I hope this was uh, interesting. Uh, perhaps some of you will eventually become interested in ophthalmology. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> That was terrific, Johnny. I really, really appreciated it. I'm going to be stopping the movie in a, about a minute, but I want you to ask you something, and something kept going through my mind, and that was very practical. Uh, what kind of sure. questions are generally asked uh, about the eye in the step one exam? Is it very minimal, or would they generally, would you feel that what you covered would probably be adequate in terms of what they might throw at them? Yeah, well... <laughs> I tried to put in any classic pictures. Like I, I can't remember. Um, step one. I'm pretty sure that the stages of microvascular disease and diabetes are. Um, I would put that as um, high priority. The, the 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 thickening of the basement membrane, the loss of parasites, the microaneurysms, and the non-perfusion. Um, step two, step three, we start looking at the, the common pictures like the blood and thunder, uh, central retinal vein occlusion. That, that's the, the classic thing. I think 
there's probably not a whole lot of stuff about the eye. Um, if it was in this talk, it was a classic item, you know, pterygiums. Uh, the um, pediatric tumors of the orbit. Um, those are the ones that come to mind right off the top of my head. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I... You know, I wish I could tell everybody I knew all this stuff, but I just learned so much new things because every year when you do this, you change it and you really uh, stimulate my uh, brain, and I really, really appreciate it. I'll uh, end it now unless there's anything else you want to say to the peanut gallery out there. No, that's it. Okay. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much.